Well, hello, everybody. Pastor Joel here with you one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. We are continuing in our God's Story series. This is part 18 of that series. Um, you really want to go back for sure and watch part 17, the previous video, but to get a, even a better context of the particular themes I'm going over, uh, you need to go back to video number 14, part 14, to really get a sense of this. And so rather than do a lot of review in this video, I would suggest that. Again, particularly, this is part two of the last video, but you really need to go to 14 to get a, a sense of, of where I am. And essentially, just a very, very brief summary, we're looking at this idea that when we, Genesis and the Tower of Babel incident, that these people were supposed to be fruitful and multiply, scatter among the earth. Yahweh had asked them to do that. Uh, they determined not to do that. And let's say he forced the issue by confusing their language and so forth. And as these nations were dispersed, and again, this is going to sound to some of you like, like a foreign or a new idea, which is why you've got to go back really to number 14 uh, to watch through those. But the idea is that, that Yahweh was going to be Israel's special God. And as we continue on in the story, of course, we'll get... Uh, more to that when we when we get to the story of Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and Jacob, who is later named Israel. Uh, but he's, he's starting to work that out. And it seems that, that Yahweh had determined that there were going to be other, what we might call uh, divine beings, um, sometimes referred to as the heavenly host, uh, small g gods, other Elohim, that he was going to appoint or assign to these other scattered nations. And eventually, as we move on in this story, Jesus sends out the 70 to, to recollect, to regather these nations that had been under the jurisdiction of these other Elohim, these other small g gods. And at Pentecost, that language that had been confused at Babel is brought back together in this great event. And that's a lot there to go over in, in just a, you know, 30, 40 seconds or whatever it was. But that's the overarching story. Now, getting back to the particulars, what I'm going to be focusing on in this video is this idea that Yahweh seemed to have the, was going to have this special relationship with the nation of Israel and some other things as well. But we're going to start with Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, which I believe we looked at last time. But just I, I don't ever want you to take my word for, for anything I teach. I want you to compare what I taught with the scriptures to determine whether or not the things I'm saying or believing are true. So Deuteronomy 4, 19, 20, and as always, I would encourage you to, to write down these passages and have them for your later reference and study. Deuteronomy 4, 19, and 20 says this, And do this so that you do not lift your eyes toward heaven and observe the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, this is addressed to Israel, and be led astray and bow down to them and serve them, things that Yahweh, your God, has allotted to all of the people under all the heaven. But Yahweh has taken you, again, specifically to Israel, and brought you out from the furnace of iron from Egypt to be a people of inheritance to him as it is this day. Again, we see that here Yahweh, your God, has allotted, and we go to that term allotted, give or apportion something to someone. So Yahweh had allotted to all these other people under the heavens, these other Elohim. Um, Paul later refers to them as principalities, powers of the air and so forth. All right, let's go on now to uh, another scripture passage. Um, this is, a I, I uh, mentioned this in the last uh, video as well, but it's a good quote. Yahweh would leave a spiritual breadcrumb trail back to himself from page 115 of the unseen realm. And again, that's going to be all the way once we get up towards the time of Pentecost. So let's go now to 2 Kings 5, uh, 19, 15 through 19 rather. And uh, we'll look at this text together. Then Naaman and all his descendants went back to the man of God. And he stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, 
May the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. What, what's going on here? This was a story that I didn't have much understanding uh, for uh, for a long time. And again, I, I just want to mention that the, the book I referenced, um, The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser, um, really covers a lot of these issues uh, really, really well. But the idea was that the, that the Naaman wanted to bring back this, this dirt to his own land. Why? Because the, the, the belief, the understanding was that Yahweh was, was Israel's God. And so literally, if some of the land from Israel was brought with him, he could then worship Yahweh even back in his other land. So fascinating idea, but I think there's a lot to that. Um, let's go on now and look at another text. This is Daniel 10, verses 13 and 20. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia stood before me for 21 days. And look, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to assist me. And I left him there beside the kings of the Persians. And now I return to fight against the prince of Persia. And I myself am going. And look, the prince of Javan will come. Now, there is some agreement in the scholarship that the princes here uh, were, were likely not human, but were divine beings. And the idea here, again, is that there were these divine beings um, that, that had jurisdiction in these other nations. Now, there is a series, that, this just is not on my notes, but just popped into my mind right now by, by Frank Peretti. Um, and I read these books years ago, a great, great books, regardless of how theologically sound they may be. But one was called, I think, Piercing the Darkness. Um, it was like at least a trilogy. Um, it's maybe some of you have read them, but they took this idea, maybe a little bit too far, but the idea is that there had the, were these different beings and things in these different realms. But it, but it's a, it a similar um, idea here that these different angels, these different Elohim, these these the heavenly host um, had jurisdiction over these various realms at um, at the time of these writings. That was the understanding, anyway. Well, with that in mind, let's move to one more um, Acts twenty Acts seventeen twenty six. And he, this is God, made from one man every nation of humanity to live on the face of the earth, determining their fixed times and the fixed boundaries of their habitation. Now, it may be that, that Paul, who was the author uh, here, or the one speaking in Acts, rather, uh, understood that he was to preach to the Gentiles as a part of Yahweh's plan to reclaim the nations that, again, had been scattered and appointed other Elohim uh, to reclaim the nations for himself. It's a fascinating idea, and I really think there's there's a lot to it. We also see something else in Paul's writings. We see these, these terms here. I mentioned this a moment ago, principalities, powers, dominions, thrones. They all have something in common. They are used in the New Testament and other Greek literature to refer to geographical domain rulership. So a similar idea here. Let's move on. Colossians uh, 14, Sorry, Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. I, I love these verses, by the way. I sometimes refer to these um, as Jesus smack down on these, you know, these principalities, these powers and so forth. Here it is. And he has taken it out of the way, he being Jesus, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made, oh, I always got to correct these errors on the fly, sorry. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. I love this. This was the ultimate fate of these beings. And now people differ as to whether or not they are still active in the world and to what extent they can now affect the world. Regardless of their role or place in the New Testament, they play a major role in the Old Testament. When you put all this together, not only is the Old Testament narrative largely about Israel versus the other nations, but Israel's God, Yahweh, versus the lesser gods. Now, now again, you may listen to this and think, Joel, I already thought you were a whack nut on your end time stuff, and now you're telling me this. Go back to video number 14. Um, I would I'll also highly recommend to you that you read Michael Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm, um, which was, um, if I had to list, just my opinion, obviously, if I had to list like 10 books that I thought every Christian should read, it would be one of them. I think it's that it's that important. Even if you don't end up agreeing with some of Heiser's conclusions, um, it, it is just, it helps make so much sense of texts and things that I was not able to make much sense of 
uh, before. So again, this 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 battle we might say talking about the the Old Testament, Israel under the Old Covenant between Israel and the other nations, but also in the spiritual realm, Israel's God Yahweh and the other Elohim. Again, there are, there are more than one Elohim. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. Amen. All right. Now to see how this fits into the overall plan of redemption, can you think of a time when the Tower of Babel incident was undone. I think I already gave this gave away the farm on this earlier. So now let's go to Acts 2, 1 through 12. That was all in a sense a sort of introductory leading up to this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Who? Who's they? I remember all these nations had come to Jerusalem. Um, the, the numbers I've seen are anywhere between you know, well over a million to possibly two million people. Um, in Jerusalem at that time. And many of those people were from these other nations for that Jewish festival of Pentecost. Verse two, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Again, what had happened at the Tower of Babel incident, all their language was confused, oh, pardon me, so that they could not understand each other. And now at Acts, all of them could hear their languages spoken miraculously. Okay, um, verse 7, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Like, how, how do they know? How do they know our languages? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. I think I did pretty well with that. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, crawdads and maybe not. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? mean. All right. And so what I am going to, to do here, I wrote in my notes, Joel, put your big face back on. What does that mean? That's what this means. And so I want to take just a little time here and try to, to explain this to sort of to tie this together for us. So essentially, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are about Yahweh creating a good world creating Adam and Eve, after which he said it was very good. Remember, good up to that point, after um, Adam and Eve, um, world very good. Just, just may I say that, that if we believe that this world is just bad and awful and terrible and wicked and we just can't wait to get out of here. I read a book, I mean, some time ago, um, that was the idea was, you know, so many believers waiting for the rapture, you know, why fight? We're on the next flight, which I thought was a, was a catchy line, uh, a little profound actually. But if that's the attitude we have, in my opinion, which I think is more than an opinion, we are, we are going against Yahweh saying this is a good world. And now you might say, yeah, it was good, but by Genesis chapter six, you know, it was terrible. It got flooded and so forth. But again, after the flood, what was the admonition? Again, be fruitful and multiply. I will never again, you know, um, curse the land. I, I will never again flood the land. And I, and I think this is a good world created by a good God. And yes, there are problems. Yes, there are issues. Yes, there is evil. Yes, there is suffering. No one's going to deny that. But this whole idea that it's just getting worse and worse and it's awful, it, it, it's hogwash. OK, it's just not the case. And there are even book, and I'll, I'll probably allude to a couple of these at, at some point, but even even statistically, just so many things that, that are getting better in the world. Again, not not at all being naive and, you know, pulling the wool over my eyes to things that are happening. But 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 um, a lot of that you know, world is terrible thing. And almost like we're yeah, this this, you know, this this is so bad is it, it, it sucks. It's horrible. Look what's happening. But, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. So I guess. Uh, we can at least celebrate that part. That really comes from dispensational teaching. It, it is not solid biblical teaching. It's just, it's just not. Okay. 
a uh, little unplanned insertion there. Again, let's sum this up. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, Yahweh creates a good world. After Adam and Eve, it's, it was said it was very good. Adam and Eve are given free reign over the garden, except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because of giving into the serpent's temptation and rebelling against Yahweh, they died spiritually the very day they ate the fruit. You might want to go back to some previous videos. Um, I don't remember exactly what I've titled them, but I've done some work in Genesis as well, and you'll get an idea of my view there, that that spiritual death did take place the very day that they ate, okay? Um, they died spiritually the very day they ate, kicked out of the garden. There's disagreement as to what role their physical death plays. Again, you can go back and check out those video. Although, of course, no one denies that they died physically um, eventually. Okay, that's not denied. Um, but here's here's something that to really consider. Um, the the traditional, the, the, the widely held, the most popular, mo the most pervasive idea as to why the world is the way it is, the, the part that the suffering that is here, the wickedness and so on, is because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Well, I think there's more to it than that when we start considering this other view that I've been going over. And so let me just go back to my notes so I can be more succinct. If you ask most Christians why the world is the way that it is, they would likely say because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Certainly there's truth to this, but as we've learned over the course of the past several videos, the ANE, ancient Near East cultures, believed there were other events in addition to the fall that are the reasons uh, for the way the world is, and to a certain extent that you know has it has been and is now. The other events were the flood and the dividing of nations at the Tower of Babel. In the ancient Near East view, those those three events would have been considered not just the one event of the fall. Though not everyone agrees, a strong case can be made that there were indeed members of the divine council. Again, sometimes this can be referred to the heavenly host, these other Elohim. There were members that can be referred to also as the watchers, referred to different things, and that they had, had inappropriate sexual relations uh, of some sort with human women resulting in the Nephilim or men of renown, and this is recorded in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. That's, that's why you've got to go back and watch these other vids. Uh, and these are the verses immediately preceding the flood account. After the flood, humanity again rebelled so that Yahweh confused their language and sent them to various places on the earth. It seems that Yahweh, as part of this judgment, allotted or appointed these 70 nations, lesser Elohim, to rule over them, and he determined to be Israel's God the new nation that he would start with a man named Abram, and we're heading into those videos soon. And his name was, of course, later changed to Abraham. It's interesting that Abram means high father or exalted father, and Abraham means what? Father of many nations. Now, whether or not you embrace what's often referred to as the divine counsel view of Genesis, you can see how much it impacts your theology one way or another. Your understanding of the Old Testament and even the New is going to be tremendously impacted by your believing or not believing in the divine counsel view. I would encourage you to continue to study this using scripture and other writings that can help. I have also referenced Heiser's The Unseen Realm quite a bit. Um, he has another book called Reversing Herman, Enoch, The Watchers, and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus. You might want to check that out. Uh, there's a book by Brian Godawa called When Giants Were Upon the Earth. And there's another book by Doug Van Dorn that I, I thought was helpful called Giants, Sons of the God. And on all of this really goes, you know, goes together with, um, in, this, in, this, in this view, at least in, in a general sense. And so again, that, that's a lot to go over. And, and I'm feeling like even as I'm, you know, have just taught through this content that boy, Without some context, it's 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 just going to be tough. And so you really want to go back to those other videos. Have I said that enough now? Um, let me also just um, share a couple other things with you. Uh, they're exciting. First of all, my my book is selling well, um, at least for for this type of a book. I've been encouraged by that. Um, I've been really encouraged by the reviews on Amazon and just the feedback I've gotten via text, messenger, email, phone calls, whatever. Um, and, and one of the things people are saying is, boy, like, like pastors should read this. Um, 
you know, people that are that are newer to this view should read this. It's really an on ramp. Um, you're really loaded with scripture, but laid out in a way that's that's easy to understand and get through. At least that's what people are telling me. Again, it's called Seismic Shift, Pastors End Times Trek. So excited about that. Um, we uh, not too long ago passed the thousand subscribers, uh, which I never would have dreamed of. Um, so if you haven't already, you know, hit that sub button, that like button, that notification bell. Um, so you can be aware of new content as it comes out. My, my internet issues I was having are now finally, I think, uh, resolved so I can be more regular getting the videos out. Um, also, I am involved in a series teaching through the book of Revelation. Um, just recorded our first session last Sunday. So just in case you're, you're watching this later, um, it is the 19th of September today, I think, which means the 21st. 22nd be Sunday. So it's around the September 15th, somewhere in there of the year 2024 is when this Revelation series uh, started. It is myself, Travis Drum, Zach Davis, Michael Sullivan, and Rick Welch from the Burroughs of Berea. Rick will have it available uh, via audio through the Burroughs podcast. The rest of us are going to put the videos on our channel. Um, I'm going to be in the process of creating a Patreon account um, and also uh, memberships and and then this this video if you want to if you want to get those series of revelation videos earlier uh, you'll be able to do it that way otherwise you can you can catch them when everybody else catches them later but um i think this is going to be super helpful it is the book of revelation taught um from a preterist perspective uh with just some guys that uh, just i'm blessed to be there with them some guys that re really have some significant knowledge of this and i think it's going to be very very helpful for you i was really encouraged by the first study we did. Um, so I think, I think that is about it. Um, and uh, just, you know, love you guys. Um, thank you for all your, your comments. I do try to get at them. Um, sometimes it takes me a while to get through them. Um, if they're really, really long and have, and sort of multi-tiered with lots of questions, just realize if I get back to you, it's nothing personal. I just, um, I, I, I just can't sometimes. It's better to keep your comments fairly brief. Ask maybe a question or two. Share a perspective. Sometimes people will share things that might be interesting theologically, but that have nothing to do with the content and the video I put out. Um, in that case, man, start your own channel um, and, and with those things. But I, I, I'm going to address the things that are, you know, that that cover the content I've talked about, um, and, and that are things, quite frankly, that I can that I can read through fairly quickly and respond to. So. So I hope you understand that. Um, hope this content has been helpful for you. And with that, I'll say Pastor Joel saying bye for now.